Welcome to the Silver Screen Guide Podcast. Join Corbin and Alan, along with guest hosts, as they bring their love for the cinema to discuss films from every genre and decade. Learn about the history of the film, little-known facts, and insightful explorations while they enjoy discussing your favorite film. The curtain is rising and your podcast is starting. So sit back, relax, and enjoy your guide to the silver screen. Happy Halloween, listeners. We hope you are having a great, fun, safe Halloween, enjoying some candy and some great horror films. Welcome to our fourth annual Halloween special. Today we are reviewing Black Christmas. Maybe not what you were expecting because it takes place around Christmas time, but nevertheless, a definite cult classic horror film that I know Alan and I are both really eager to share our thoughts on. This is your co-host Corbin. I'm Alan. And yeah, this is a movie I've wanted to see for a long time and just never had a chance to until it was put on Amazon Prime pretty recently, actually. And then Corbett is like, hey, let's talk. Let's just review it for Halloween. And now here we are. Listeners, grab some candy, grab your spooky mountain mystery do and kick back and relax and enjoy. Enjoy those sweets while we talk about Black Christmas. Now, Black Christmas was released December 20th, 1974 in the United States. It was released on October 11th, 1974 in Canada, because this is actually a Canadian film. And it was directed by Bob Clark. He uh, he did a little film a couple years later that is mm -hmm. quite popular that I'm sure many of you will know, listeners. Bob Clark directed A Christmas Story. That's right. Yeah, he did direct A Christmas Story. But I've seen the three movies leading up to this, oh, actually in succession. So I have now seen the first four Bob Clark movies all the way through. Um, it's been a pretty interesting ride, let me just say. Yeah, I remember when Alan brought up Bob Clark like a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. you were saying, have you heard of him? And I said, no. And he's like, well, he directed A Christmas Story. And I'm like, well, okay, I've seen A Christmas Story more times than I can count. Right. Just a little insight for you listeners. I put that movie on before bed. I don't know what grade I was in. I was in like the seventh grade. I put that movie on before bed every night and I memorized probably the first half hour at least of the movie um, before I would fall asleep, of course. I don't have it that much memorized now, but I had all of that dialogue down, all of the cues and everything. So when you said, well, he directed A Christmas Story and he also directed Black Christmas, I was really surprised because I did watch Black Christmas for the first time last December. And it's definitely one of those movies I had just always heard about with mm -hmm. if you're plugged into movies at all, then you've likely heard of Halloween. But if you're definitely plugged into horror movies at all, Black Christmas is one that has likely popped up. But I think one that not a lot of people necessarily know about. It definitely has more of a cult following. Oh, yeah. No, this when this movie was released, I know it did great in Canada and did horrible in the U.S., but has since developed a huge cult following. And that's because it's become, we've come to find out, it ended up being very influential for a lot of horror movies that would come out after it. And one of the things I noted when I was watching it this first time is how many similarities there are with just horror movies in general and what would become cliches, but weren't necessarily cliches at the time of this release. Yeah, Miranda and I, my girlfriend, we... The beginning of October, we watched a film that is not highly regarded amongst horror fans, but it is When a Stranger Calls, which is itself based off of, I believe, a Korean horror film. I, I could be mistaken on that. Uh, have you seen it, Alan? I know I've heard of it, but I have not seen it, no. But the whole concept of a young single female being alone in a house and then receiving kind of very ominous calls from strangers. We are so used to that now. Oh, yeah. And even some of that we see a little bit in John Carpenter's Halloween. But this film, I'm sure there was probably some obscure film before this that probably used the idea. But nevertheless, this one definitely really 
I would say, pioneered that. And as Alan said, the reason it didn't do very well in the United States is it wasn't even titled Black Christmas. They right. titled they changed the title to Silent Night, Evil Night. And the entire reason they did that was because Warner Brothers, who distributed it here in the United States, they feared audiences would think the movie to be a black exploitation flick, kind right. of along the lines of a Pam Greer type movie um, with the title Black Christmas. Nothing could be further from the truth. And then when it was distributed to television, they changed the name again to Stranger in the House. So if they would have given this a bit more of a directive marketing campaign, more of a focused one, I think this film could have done very well here in the United right. States. Right. And this is also not the first time a Bob Clark movie uh, since he's been making movies has had many different titles. The movie he made right before this, which is called Death Dream or Dead of Night, depending on where you're looking, uh, <laughs> has multiple different titles. It's got those two. And it's got, like, I think, three or four others that you can find, but mostly Death Dream and Dead, uh, Dead of Night are the two main ones. So this is not the first time that a movie of Bob Clark's has received multiple titles uh, for various reasons. So, yeah. The film is written by Roy Moore, who's only written other, only one other theatrical film after this, which was called The Last Chase. I've never heard of it, but he had written a little bit of television before, a little bit of TV after, and then only one film. It's kind of interesting that they chose Roy Moore to write the screenplay, but I will say that I'm glad they did pick him. And his original screenplay was titled Stop Me, and it was based right. upon the urban legend more so specifically Canadian about the babysitter and the man upstairs. And right. you'll notice this film was shot on location in Toronto and it was shot at the university of Toronto. You do see the famous soldier's tower in the film. So those of you wondering where this is uh, located and an in another interesting tidbit is the disturbing phone calls were recorded by numerous actors, including Nick Mancuso and Bob Clark himself. Uh, Mancuso said he stood on his head to compress his thorax to further distort his voice. Right. And I do know that Bob Clark in an interview on the Blu-ray, he talks about how a lot of like the, the very intense yelling uh, parts of the uh, phone calls are oftentimes him. Mm. Um, yeah. So going back to the script real quick, uh, come to find out um, Roy Moore had actually written the script. Yeah, he written it, wrote it and called it Stop Me based on what you said, and then put it out to a bunch of production companies. And then the one that uh, Bob Clark was a part of, because at this point he had then he had since immigrated to Canada, it popped by his desk and he looked at it and said, it looks kind of interesting. But the final version that we have is a bit different than what was originally written. Bob Clark did go in and make some changes himself, but the core idea was still there that there was a caller who actually ended up being inside the house and was terrorizing the soror this uh, the sorority. So the script itself uh, was almost uh, given to Bob Clark just out of sheer luck because uh, otherwise it may not have gone very far or been in the hands of a director who didn't do it just who wouldn't have, who wouldn't have done it justice like we see here. They also weren't given a very large budget to make this film on. Yeah. They were given only $620,000. And most movies usually have a budget of at least $1 million. It's right. usually unlikely unless you're going, especially if you're going farther back than 74. Usually around 74 movies were hitting that $1 million mark and rapidly increasing from there. But... This film does actually have a bigger budget, though, than John Carpenter's Halloween, which, if memory serves, was around 325000 somewhere around that mark. So we can see it's not quite double, but it's pretty close to uh, double the amount of budget, even though this and you can tell this movie doesn't have a large budget. But I think that's also part of its kind of allure and part of mm -hmm. what makes this film what it is and just so drawing is the lower budget. Right. And I know because of the low budget, they didn't have enough to really hire extras. So a lot of the scenes that have a lot of extra actors in it, like a lot of outside shots uh, when they're doing the search or 
uh, even one in the very beginning in the interior when they're having the party, there are a lot of uh, extra people. Those are actually part of the crew. That's oh, wow. crew playing roles or par- or a crew's like sibling also playing a role, a, role, a small role uh, just to fill whatever. Uh, so yeah, they didn't have a lot of money to pay a lot of extras. So a lot of the people here that you see in the background that aren't main actresses or actors are actually part of the crew. Now, when the film was released for theatrical distribution here in the United States, the initial reviews really weren't positive. Uh, it was mixed, but there was some negative reaction to the film. Gene Siskel of Siskel and Ebert gave the film one and a half out of four stars. Yes. And Leonard Maltin, who was also another famous film uh, critic, historian, gave it two and a half out of four stars. But that's just how a lot of these films were originally. Halloween right. wasn't well received when it first came out. Psycho was quite traumatic for audiences and it was ahead of its time. And in a way, I think this movie was clearly ahead of its time as well, as we'll discuss here in just a minute. Oh, yeah. Now, I did want to talk about kind of the influences and history of this film. Because I, I think a lot of people don't really know this. I think a lot of people think Psycho is the kind of grandfather of modern slashers. But then I think even more horror fans think Halloween is what kicked off most modern slashers. Right. And they do miss two very important films in the horror genre. And I guess particularly maybe you could say the slasher genre. I, I struggle to call these films slasher films per se but nevertheless the two important films they're missing is michael powell's peeping tom and bob clark's black christmas now i would say this film is the child of peeping tom whereas psycho is the child uh, or i'm sorry whereas halloween is the child of psycho now i'll explain why i say that Michael Powell and Alfred Hitchcock were both British film directors. They were both contemporaries, they were friends, and they knew each other. And in 1960, they both released films about a very disturbed man who is a serial killer, but they take very very different approaches to it. Now, in Peeping Tom, the film is in color, and that is the very first horror film to show the killer's point of view. Right. And um, Michael Powell released his film mostly overseas in Britain, and it was not well received. Of course, it's gone on to have much more critical acclaim and cult acclaim now. Everybody that's really kind of plugged in and connected to the horror genre thinks highly of Peeping Tom. Now, Alfred Hitchcock decides to make Psycho. The studio is wary about funding a film about which we did review psycho by the way listeners so uh that was that was last year's halloween special so definitely go back and listen to our review of psycho the studio is very wary about funding this type of movie and it would eventually be re-rated to an r so at the time it was very controversial so hitchcock decided to go for a lower budget and that's why the film was made in black and white but that movie mostly focuses on um, an external um, serial killer that is very misunderstood. And uh, John Carpenter would come along in 1978. And he would kind of blend some things from Peeping Tom, mostly probably the point of view, but that once again focuses on a disturbed serial killer that we never quite understand and his fascination with stalking this woman. Okay, stick with me, listeners. I'm almost done here. So with Peeping Tom, I say the reason that Black Christmas is the child of Peeping Tom is because we always get the killer with the point of view in this film. We never see the killer in full frame. And to me, this is the killer has some kind of uh, bizarre sexual fascination with these young women. And the whole premise of Peeping Tom is he is takes body photographs of women as well with his camera and he captures their murder on camera. So I, it's kind of hard to also describe if you haven't seen these films, but I highly recommend checking out peeping Tom. I watched that last Halloween for the first time. I absolutely loved the film. So definitely 
watch Peeping Tom and then watch Black Christmas. Then I recommend you watch Psycho and then watch Halloween. And you can kind of see the uh, outbirth of both of those films from those two British directors. Right. And I know you've definitely talked, we've definitely talked about Peeping Tom, a movie that you say I really need to watch and I really do need to watch it. But I know in the special features, John Carpenter, uh, he wasn't in the special features, but Bob Clark, Bob Clark talks about this, how John Carpenter did in fact see this movie and absolutely loved it and said, and went up to Bob Clark and asked him, Hey, if you were to make a sequel to Black Christmas, what would it be about? And Bob Clark says some of the effect of, well, if I was to make uh, a sequel to Black Christmas, it would probably take place on Halloween night. Um, and then kind of explains a couple more things. But essentially, John Carpenter took that idea that Bob Clark had and then made a movie around it because, as he explains in the Blu-ray, it, the idea that he gave him and the uh, the final product of his film or have a lot of similarities to him. However, although I'm sure that there is a lot of inspiration of Peeping Tom on this movie, and then that transfers over to uh, to what will become Halloween, as well as Halloween taking a lot from Psycho. There's a lot of connections here. It's it's more of a uh, evolution, I guess you could say, of the of the slasher genre coming into what it would eventually become. And I would think that uh, it seems like Halloween's the one that really defined what will become a lot of modern slashers, but it's black Christmas that really helped begin this slasher genre. It just in the first place. Absolutely. And I, the reason that I say probably peeping Tom and black Christmas are a little more connected is because we are put within the point of view of the murderer. Right. Whereas with Halloween and psycho, there is the opening of Halloween. That is the point of view of the murderer, but that's we're, we're never given that really again it's more right. so this horrifying external force that's hard to understand and seems fairly unstoppable so i would say probably their approaches are different in that capacity but similar as far as you're talking with the directors yeah and absolutely i i was actually very surprised to find out when i did uh, look into this movie when i watched it last christmas was that this did come out four years, a full four years before John Carpenter's Halloween, which is kind of crazy because people are like, oh my gosh, Halloween started the slasher genre. When you clearly see this movie, Halloween drew so much inspiration oh, yeah. from this film, so much. Oh yeah, absolutely. And this film currently holds a 7.2 on IMDb. Now compared with Halloween, Halloween has a 7.8 on IMDb. As for um, the Rotten Tomatoes scores, critics gave Black Christmas a 71% approval rating and audiences have given it a 75% approval rating. Now for Halloween, critics gave Halloween an overwhelming 96% approval rating and audiences gave it an 89% approval rating. There are, uh, we know Halloween has an 81 on Metascore, whereas Black Christmas does not have a Metascore or a Cinema Score. And um, the box off, the only worldwide box office numbers I can get were this film made $4 million. I'm not sure if that is domestically or worldwide per se. Gotcha. I'm guessing most of that probably came from Canada just because I, from what I've heard, it's, it did best in Canada and it didn't, did a, eh, not great in the U S yes, but $4 million off a $620,000 budget is very, very good, especially for oh, 1974. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's great money. I mean, but, from the ratio from budget to what, what you make back is great. Yeah. But as you can see, audiences and critics do favor Halloween over Black Christmas. Right. And I think that is because Halloween has been an enduring legacy. It's spawned like 12 sequels, and we are getting another sequel next year and then a sequel the year after that, right? don't worry, listeners, we will be coming back for our Halloween retrospective series to review those films as well. But I really do think Black Christmas would be more so on par with Halloween if more people saw it. But I think this is in some ways kind of it's continually the best kept secret of the horror franchise in general. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. 
All right, listeners, we are going to be getting into spoilers for Black Christmas. So if you haven't seen the film, which I highly recommend you do watch the film before we spoil it. As Alan already mentioned, it is on Prime Video right now, which is awesome because I've never seen it on a streaming service until this October. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember this film was not always very easy to get your hands on, but um, Alan, you did pick up the Blu-ray. Yeah, I did. Uh, hopefully this isn't tipping my hand too early, but <laughs> I watched it for the first time uh, bef about a few days before we did this recording and then immediately went out and bought the Blu-ray off of Amazon. So, yeah. <laughs> so, Alan may have liked the film a little bit. He's not going to to tell you anymore for <laughs> the time being. But yeah, it is really cool that uh, Shout Factory did a really nice Blu-ray release of the film. And you yeah. said it comes loaded with bonus features. Oh yeah, yeah. There's hours of bonus features. It's crazy. Yeah, that would be great to have. I would love to pick that up as well. But like I said, listeners, we are going to spoil Black Christmas for you. So if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend um, to go check it out especially now that today is October 31st, it's Halloween. This will be a great movie, especially if you haven't seen it before to give you a really great time on Halloween. As the Christmas holiday approaches, a group of sorority sisters are having a party to celebrate the end of the semester when an unknown madman, who is actually played by Albert J. Dunk, but is never shown, sneaks into the attic on the third floor of their sorority house. One of the girls, Claire, played by Lynn Griffin, turns in early when she is attacked by the assailant and suffocated to death by a plastic clothes cover in her closet. The murderer moves her to the attic where she is never found. But preceding these events, the women have been receiving obscene phone calls ranging from insane ramblings to vile sexual insults. The following day, Claire's father, Mr. Harrison, played by James Edmund, is waiting to pick her up, but she never shows. The sorority's house mother, Mrs. Mack, played by Marion Waldman, is of no help, and she's also a lush. Becoming increasingly worried, Mr. Harrison, a few girls, and Claire's boyfriend go to the police station to find some answers. Sergeant Nash, played by Doug McGrath, is a no-help bumbling idiot. Meanwhile, Jess, played by Olivia Hussey, decides to tell her boyfriend, Peter, played by Kier Duella, from a little film called 2001 A Space Odyssey. Hmm, I don't know if I've ever heard of that movie. You you may have missed it, listeners. Uh, I recommend you look it up. <laughs> Anyways, Jess tells Peter, her boyfriend, that she's pregnant with their child. Only problem is, she's made up her mind to have an abortion. Peter's strongly against it, and he has a big recital that evening. But he wants to talk with Claire afterwards. During the recital... His mind is too preoccupied, and he fears he botched it, and in a fit of rage, afterwards destroys the piano. Later that night, Barb, played by Margot Kidder, Lois Lane from Superman, becomes irate and drunk, expressing everyone believes Claire's disappearance to somehow be her fault. She goes upstairs to sleep it off, but is later murdered by the psycho. But not before Mrs. Mack falls prey to the psycho in the attic. Eventually, Peter comes over to express how he's quitting the observatory and they're going to be married. Jess denies him, which prompts him to leave in sadness. Also, that night, a search party is underway, not only for Claire, but also for a young girl whose mother fears the worst. During the search party, they find the young girl murdered in the park. Believing the disappearance of Claire, the obscene phone calls, and the murdered girl to be linked, Lieutenant Ken Fuller, played by John Saxon, from A Nightmare on Elm Street, has the sorority's phones tapped. As Jess and her sorority sister Phil, played by Andrea Martin, from My Big Fat Greek Wedding, which I didn't even realize until this viewing, as, though, as they wait for the killer to call and trace it, Phil finds herself to be the next victim. Finally, Jess gets the killer on the line long enough, but to her horror learns the call is coming from within the house. She finds Barb and Phil murdered and is chased to the basement by the murderer. Peter, whom the police and even Jess have suspicions may be the unstable assailant, breaks through the basement window to supposedly save Jess. The police arrive just too late as they find Jess has killed Peter. After the police and doctors have put Jess to sleep in her bed, the phone rings once again and the killer is still loose in the attic as credits roll. So positive right off the bat. Uh, 
Mm, which one should I start with first, the music or the uh, POV opening shot? I'm going to go with music first. Um, okay. Th- okay. Uh, there are times where I think the music, and this is not the film's fault, it's just by the legacy. I think the music that is on dis- that is in the movie is used quite often in other movies. It's mostly that uh, those piano wires being strung. Do you hear that quite a bit in movies that came later? But that and just the spooky sounds that come, especially when you first we first get to experience the killer walking about the front part of the house, that just gets me on edge really quick because of how just eerie it is. When I did first see this movie last Christmas, I sat on the front row of my theater room. So that POV shot was Ooh. in my face. And from that point onward, I was completely immersed into this film. And I do also love that it takes place roughly within 24 hours. Yeah. The entire yeah. story does. And that POV shot of the killer approaching the house and then climbing the lattice work all the way up to the attic. I think this is probably the horror movie, at least visually, that I've always wanted, but I've never seen before, where the graininess of the camera and just the grittiness, uh, even the realism of -hmm. it all, uh, just how the attic looks, how everything feels so grounded in reality, and yet everything has such a fear to it such kind of a darkness to it and we're immediately thrown into that world and just the thought of this killer so easily getting into the attic and they're having a party below and they just go without knowing it for so long and it's all within their noses yeah immediately that's my first thing that pulls me into this film and i love it the whole way through oh yeah absolutely and they take they waste no time setting up what exactly this movie is going to be because the the killer enters the house after right, almost right after the opening credits. And then the first kill happens, I think about 11 minutes in, which may seem like a pretty long time, but it's also, it's the also, of course, opening credits to get through, but you also have this, like for you, for, sounds like for you and me it was a very intriguing story just to begin with, just getting ourselves into the movie. Did for like a long time at all before the first kill happens. And so this movie seems to be moving and getting you into the horror pretty quick. Whereas with other horror movies, sometimes, oftentimes it is, they take their time to get to certain parts and certain moments in this movie. Whereas this starts off and almost, almost, almost immediately gets right into it. And I love that because it, and it also kind of, kind of lowers regard, especially for experienced horror fans who haven't seen this before. They kill the virgin first, which is completely backwards from the cliche. Yeah, that is right. They do kill. The goody two shoes right off the bat. And because we know the other girl is a drunk and probably has lots of other sexual encounters. Mm-hmm. And the main girl is contemplating abortion. So she's no virgin either. But you're right. They completely subvert our expectations by having this seemingly very nice girl um, that, you, you know, like I said, she seems very nice and likable. And it's yeah. interesting because they bring her father into it. She goes right off the bat. But immediately, I'm not really worried about how quickly we're going to see the first death. Because I'm really not here for... And this film is pretty obvious about that. They're really not here to show you the deaths. Right. And that's one thing I love about it. I'm, I'll am i talk about that here in just a minute. But what Bob Clark is doing so well here and the rest of his crew is they're building atmosphere, which is so important that most, almost all modern horror films completely miss today. And the thing that I think this film does so well is they're able to build atmosphere without the score. Yeah. And I think that's one thing that vastly separates it from Halloween is that I love the score in Halloween, but they do use the score frequently to build atmosphere, whereas this film uses the uh, position of the house and the killer and um, just even kind of this very cold environment, how you can't really go outside. You mostly just want to be staying in the house and using all of that together builds a really tight atmosphere that winds me around its finger mm-hmm. until the very end when it just snaps. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, and one of the other things I could add on to that atmosphere is also its sound effects and its sound design. But I think that what we do have here also just it could not be uh, any other way, where without the sound design that we have here, or even a high importance on sound in this movie when it comes to sound effects, uh, that would not it would greatly negate the atmosphere that's built here because what we do have in terms of sound effects, mostly from uh, the killer, is super effective. Does a really good job um, at crafting, also adding on to that atmosphere of his creepiness in the house and the fact that these characters just have no idea uh, up until literally the, the very end of the movie when everyone else is dead that there's somebody in the house. And I do think that lends it to the realism that I was speaking about earlier is this yep. is actual, this is actually a house mm-hmm. that they uh, paid the owner to lease uh, for the film. And yeah, the way the house is utilized in such a realistic manner, how it's able to balance this very claustrophobic feeling, how the killer is literally right up the stairs, which they right. could look up and see him at any moment, it seems like. But nevertheless, it feels so cavernous in such a way that uh, he could be anywhere and they wouldn't even know it. And yeah, also the way they kind of utilize his uh, kind of belabored breathing. And we always just see his hands, except for that one incredible shot of his eye mm-hmm. through the crack in the door. Um, yeah, the way that they uh, shoot the house and obscure certain things in shadows and isolate um isolate the killer upstairs and then isolate um our protagonist downstairs really does give such an incredible space of the house and usage of it that i i don't think i've ever really seen it done better in any other horror film yeah and this is something they did talk about in the special features is a lot of great horror films have that iconic house probably the best example of this is psycho psycho was kind of one of the things it's known for is the design of the bates of the bates house um, but this is a bit different because this one, this movie where, uh, where Psycho takes place mostly outside of the house, this movie takes place almost completely inside of its house. So you get a really good feel of the house and that makes it even more scarier because the killer we know is just in the attic. But the, as the audience member, we are the only ones who know that the people on screen, the characters on screen don't know that that makes it even more effective because of just how close they are to danger but they're they have no idea that's one of the first feelings i had when watching the film is that looks like such a wonderful cozy house and Mm -hmm. the film opens with a party and it looks completely safe it doesn't look like there would ever be anything horrifying about it but immediately the safety of home and kind of that warmth is turned into a very terrifying atmosphere where this man is able to move freely through the upper regions of the house and he doesn't come down till the very end. Right. And also the thing is we never get a, we never put a face to the murderer. We just have this demented multi-personality voice that Mm -hmm. we hear over the phone. So realizing there is the house itself isn't safe, especially in winter um, when you just want nothing more than to be inside and out of the cold. Right. And this completely reverses that point and it's get out of the house out in the cold is where it's actually safe. Right. Right. And even I, even the killer himself is so interesting to me because he's clearly a psychologically disturbed person. And we kind of get bits and pieces as to where he came from to these phone calls. And I've been kind of, I've been able to gather what exact possibly what exactly uh, he came from, which seems to be that he had a sister that was a lot younger than him that he sounds like he murdered and his parents uh, were not happy about that. Bob Clark does kind of talk about this uh, in the special features, but it's, it's just so interesting to get, pick up those bits and pieces um, throughout the phone calls that he, that happened throughout this movie, that there are a lot of phone calls uh, and be able to kind of link that to the murderer and have that. He's not, he's here. He may be here for reasons that aren't explained, but we know what exactly he's been through, which is super interesting from a psychological perspective in my mind. And I will say in those aspects, that does make supposedly his name is Billy. Yes. 
supposedly. We don't know that for a complete fact, but that seems to be what he calls himself or references himself in the third person. But in some ways, I think that makes him more frightening and more interesting than Michael Myers because Mm -hmm. Halloween opens. We see him just as a kid murdering his sister on Halloween night, which is plenty disturbing. Right. But we only receive these insane ramblings over the phone uh, of this killer. And just the fact of that is far more disturbing because we know so little about him and we don't even know what he looks like. Right. So that I think possibly could have backfired on them, but they keep him in the shadows and utilize this murderer so well. And his motives are so obscure yet there's still just enough of a hook for us to stay interested. I think that was such a unique and smart idea. Whereas in previous horror films, you always see the killer in open in the light of day and i think one of the faults of psycho which you can definitely go listen to our view and hear more thoughts about that but they explained everything in the end of psycho right. about norman bates whereas thankfully we don't get lieutenant uh fisher telling us billy's backstory right. at the end yeah and i love how much and this goes to how they build fear how much it is straight up don't explain. That's probably the biggest and best example is the killer himself. We don't really ever get uh, really any kind of explanation as to where he came from, why he's here, what his motives are. There's none of that. None of those questions are ever answered for us. And I love that because that's how you, that's a really smart way. And especially of how it's used and, and I was used and then utilized here is how much they just don't tell you. How much information is mostly the killer uh, that they just don't sort of don't tell you, and then because of that fear of the end, because of that um, information that isn't isn't trans isn't translated and given to the audience, they're able to take that and then build fear off of that. I think that's very very interesting, and I I wish more horror movies would do this. They do. There the fear of the unknown is used a lot, but it's not used in a way that I think I've ever seen it used like this before, where the motives of the killer or just any kind of motives of whatever's happening in the setting is always given some kind of explanation. Even in Halloween, we understand it's because of that opening scene uh, and where Michael has his fears and what his motives are and why he's doing the things that he does. However, uh, in Black Christmas, we never really get any of that. There is no explanation for a lot of things in this movie. And that's what makes it, I think, so effective. And I will also say that the look of the house as well, I think, is creates just as a scary environment as the killer himself. I think the two are almost tied together. Yeah. How he yeah. kind of makes this home in the attic where we get that really disturbing shot of Claire still has the bag over her head and he puts the baby in her arms and he's rocking them and he keeps Agnes fish hooked up. Agnes, uh, is that her name? I don't Mrs. know. Mrs. Mac. Mrs. Mac. I don't yeah. Where did I get Agnes from? <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, Mrs. Mac. Yeah. He keeps her, um, hooked up there and you can tell he's kind of trying to create this really weird home and trying to seemingly eliminate anyone that kind of gets in the way of his kind of demented creation. Right. But I think that also only works so well as far as how uh, just kind of ominous the house looks. It's really hard for me to put it into words. I would say the closest like experience I've ever had to this um, is there is a house. It's not there anymore, but it was by uh, where we used to go to church. And I one time saw into the basement and went into the basement of that house and just the look of the basement and just the feeling of it was so frightening that there didn't need to be a Billy down there for me to be afraid. Right. It was just, uh, just like I said, just the atmosphere of it and the entire look of it. So, uh, absolutely. Um, the other thing is we never really see any completion of deaths in this film. Mm-hmm. We begin with Claire's death, which cuts off. And then we just see a a stark cut to her rocking in the chair with her mouth agape from being suffocated. And I would say the closest death we get to an actual one is when Billy is stabbing um, Margot Kidder's 
character when he's taking like her glass menagerie and just stabbing down on her. And then he kind of hangs out in that room for a while. Mm -hmm. So if I'm correct, there are six dead bodies, I think, but we really only briefly see um, three of them. And I'm including the dead girl at within the, within the kill count. So this film doesn't have a lot of them, but they use them very effectively because once again, I think this is something that's been very lost in modern horror films is the modern horror films are so gory. We become desensitized to the deaths and there's really nothing frightening. It's just mostly off putting. Whereas this is more so frightening because uh, we don't see it and yeah. we're left to wonder, oh my gosh, what is going on here? Yeah. The only one that you said that we see is Barb when she's stabbed in her bed. Uh, and that even, uh, even then, even though we have only the one, I think that's just enough to show what this guy, what the, what Billy is capable of, which gives us, which then of course switches on the imagination in our minds as to what did he do, uh, with Phil when she walks into that room. And then the only thing we know that ever happens is sh she all of a sudden is dead the next time we see her, uh, at least with bar or with, uh, the girl who dies first and then with Mrs. Mack, we have some kind of resolution as to uh, how they died, right? First girl had a bag over her head. Mrs. Mack got a hook in, into her head. Um, but outside of that, um, and uh, and so we have the first three kills are all, they all have some kind of resolution to it. Phil, we can make up in our mind how how this came about, but we don't know exactly how she died. We just next thing we see her after she goes upstairs to go to sleep is she's dead. So, yeah, I love the fact that they just don't show uh, a lot of the kills in this movie. The only one they actually full show in full is Barb, and that's also a very effective scene because it's also kind of interesting and in how ironic it is because of Barb's character and how she's kind of like the party animal gets around a lot kind of girl of the group. And she's the one, the only one that we see her death in full. And the other thing that the film does so well is it's able to maintain tension throughout. And I don't think that tension ever truly goes away. Yeah. There are probably moments of reprieve, but we know that killer is constantly in the house and someone is always in danger. And I think the film does a really good, the story does a really good job of killing off characters when we don't necessarily think they may die. Mm -hmm. There's no really sequential order of who's going to go. It's just like if you walk into the wrong room, you're going to die, which keeps up the constant tension of something's gone wrong. And also, um, the, her, Claire's father, Mr. Harrison, is not really sure where his daughter is. And at the same time, this brings up a much deeper theme, which I find to be very interesting for the film, is one daughter is dead, and then Jess is going to have a baby, and she wants the baby dead. Right. And Peter doesn't want the baby dead, but the killer is also uh, murdering these girls as well. So they kind of bring up a surprising topic here, and a surprising parallel as well as to these horrible murders are occurring and um, people are not really uh, realizing what's going on. But then at the same time, our protagonist who are supposed to be on her side also wants to uh, like have an abortion with her baby and not really give a second thought to it. Right. And I think you kind of talked, you just mentioned this a second ago too, the killer, we find out, or and we kind of are led to believe that he killed what I would assume is his sister, Agnes. Uh, Bob Clark does explain that he, in his mind, he believes that uh, he, that Billy, the killer, didn't like his sister, Agnes. And so eventually he ended up killing her, which makes it even more interesting to me that it almost feels like, in a way, uh, Jess is the prize for him. If he can get the Jess then that's it. And we know, and of course, Jess is the last person to die in the sorority house. And she's the only one, at least as far as we are aware, that it, at least as far as we brings to light, she's the only one that is pregnant at this point. So it makes it even my mind all the more frightening seeing that connection of the killer who had killed his sister in the past. Also, in some way, 
almost as if he's trying to get to Jess uh, there at the very end, who was almost, it was at the point where she knows she's pregnant. And eventually, if she didn't die at the end, would give birth, maybe, but she wants an abortion. An abortion. So it's interesting to me, it's finding that connection between the killer and then who would eventually become a protagonist. But we're, but it's never confirmed that Jess dies in the end. It's insinuated she probably will. That's true. That I guess that does raise up the point of the ending is, did Jess actually die? And in my mind, I think she did, mostly because of the pattern that we've seen time and time again with the killer, who after every time he kills somebody, will phone in and will fo- call that same house, uh, the same number, like he did every time before. Yeah, and the film brings up a really large question that I think it's going to leave it up to us to answer and uh, just kind of debate about and question is uh, kind of the overall question of life and death and death of the innocent opposed to evil that continues to live on. Mm -hmm. Because I almost see a possible pro-life message within this story i'm not trying to get political here at all or anything but the the topic of abortion is very strong and peter is extremely opposed to it um opposed he's saying we can't kill our baby but then at the same time we also know billy has that weird fascination with kind of wanting the baby or trying to recreate that scenario and nevertheless we see a lot of murder of innocent people which we are supposed which we are against and we don't want to happen. So then it begs the question, how can we um, be okay with Jess wanting to abort her baby? Now, the film doesn't really land on any specific answer there, but nevertheless, it's in the story for a reason for, I believe, for us to talk about, which is surprising to me because most horror films don't give you a, that much of a reason to care about the main girl. Right. And they also really don't give you with any lingering questions about the death you just saw. Um, a lot of horror films are exploitative and just you just go see the movie to watch people die and not really care. Whereas we are caring about these people dying. And then it's further bringing up the question, is abortion murder? Is that OK for this uh, baby to die as well? Mm-hmm. And in some ways, just kind of got what she wanted in the end uh yeah. she did want the abortion and if you i guess is it doesn't really have confirmation but uh it's the movie seems to insinuate that just does die due to the killer and so she, in some ways she did get what she wanted in the end um it's, I would, it's kind of hard for me to say that the movie has that main uh, theme of be careful what you wish for it doesn't really ever dive into that kind of a question outside of maybe Jess's character. But that is something and I think it is the connection we can make is that Jess did in fact get what she wanted in the end. And also what you mentioned just a second ago with the killing of innocent people. Uh, a lot of horror movies, and this is more of a cliche than it is uh, anything else. The, a lot of the murders that happen usually happen for some kind of a reason, whether that be that this character is just impure uh, or for whatever reason, that's probably the main reason why. But in this one, there really isn't ever a good reason as to why these girls are picked off the way that they are. It just seems to be like this is just how the story played out. And these girls die for whatever reason. Maybe there even is, maybe there isn't even a reason at all for one of them to die. Like for Phil, for example, I don't think ever has anything in her character that would be considered to be impure or bad. She just dies because she's in the wrong place at the wrong time. And so it, it's interesting that um, this movie, like you said, brings up this question of innocent death, uh, because that seems to be one of the main things here. We also don't ever see uh, any death outside of barbs all the way through. And I think that's the, uh, uh, probably the biggest point of the film is to ask us to be uncomfortable with death of all kinds and to not be desensitized towards it in various forms. Because remember, um, Roe v. Wade happened the year before this film came out, which legalized abortion in all 50 states right. in the United States through the Supreme Court. So abortion, because this film would have likely have been written, um, or the ideas would have been being bounced around at the very least in 1973, when that huge landmark case happened in the United States. 
So that was a very hot button issue of the time. So that's very likely why it's used in this film. And I do like that they are going to make us wrestle with the question because very, very rarely do we see a horror film that does ask us to question death and then become, and then it makes us very uncomfortable with that question as well. After seeing all these innocent girls die, and then we know one of those girls is pregnant and she is clearly horrified by um, these phone calls and by the death of her friends, but she seems to not be horrified by the fact that she will not uh, she's totally fine with stopping a life from entering this world, right. which then begs the question, how is that different from what Billy's doing? And then in the end, she technically does commit murder. It's not really self-defense because Peter is not the murderer. So she does uh, murder Peter in the end. She thinks it's self-defense, but um, she does. And I remember that shocked me. I did not expect Peter to die. Yeah. And one thing I think really helps with building the fear is how resolutionless this movie really is. Because you get this character, Jess is the best example of this, and Peter as well, uh, kind of ties into this resolutionless uh, main theme. But with Jess, you think, okay, she's going to live in the end. Uh, but surprise, the ending kind of insinuates something completely different and i do kind of want to talk about the ending here in a little bit and how effective it is but it does kind of leave you alone with this why didn't i get to see that kind of feeling where why didn't i get to see what exactly happened to just why isn't there an answer here and that is kind of a big thing for this movie in general is there are just kind of no answers really anywhere in this movie outside of maybe just a few it's that's kind of what makes it very effective is how much it doesn't tell you and then you want those answers but you can, just can't have them because that's I mean that's just part of how the movie builds horror. Yeah, and I don't get scared during horror movies anymore. I've just seen enough of them. Um, most of them really aren't that gripping anyway because they're not really intent upon telling a a horrible story. It's mostly about creating jump scares and just spiking your blood pressure, I guess, for five minutes instead of really truly creating something absolutely terrifying. And I think a lot of um, these older films, and I guess technically you could consider this a foreign film, um, those do that far better because not all of them, but some of them, um, there's a really great film that I recommend you check out, listeners. It did get a Criterion release last year, I believe. It's called Don't Look Now. Um, I believe I caught that when it was on Prime. So if it ever comes back around, I highly suggest you watch it. But that one as well does uh, an incredible job of building um, that horror. And I've already mentioned this before, but kind of that underlying tension never goes away. It only increases. And I will say when I did first watch this film, I was all by myself on the front row in the theater room and I was wrapped up in all these blankets. And as soon as they say, Jess, don't go upstairs. The call is coming from upstairs from that point onwards and then she goes upstairs and you see billy's eye and you see billy's legs running down the stairs the shadow of it and then you see peter's shadow in the basement and then he breaks through oh my gosh i was completely engrossed in the film and when peter does uh kick the window to come through i actually jumped i was that <laughs> invested in the film and with it so i i couldn't even believe how invested i had to become by the end of the film Oh, yeah. No, this is a movie when about halfway through, I was getting that feeling of I never want this to end because <laughs> I was so interested as to what I was watching. That is one of the things I just did not want it to finish. And uh, OK, I, I guess um, one thing that I could see as a possible disappointment, but not really. I think they were probably leaving it up to us and. Uh, let me just go ahead and say it is I think some people might be disappointed that um, they didn't show whether Jess changes her mind and has a vested interest in her baby. Now, I, I think the whole reason is that probably would have been a completely false character motivation change that we wouldn't have what well, we wouldn't have bought into because Jess simply doesn't have the time 
to really think that through. Right. That's left up to us to think through as we're doing right now. But I could, I can see some people thinking that the uh, whole abortion baby thing may have been dropped. But if you look deeper, it's not really dropped. That's kind of where the whole ending revolves around. But we can go ahead and talk about that end. Yeah. Okay. I love this ending. I love it so much. <laughs> okay, now tell me, you where do you where are you marking the ending? At? Okay, I'm parking. I'm marking the ending uh, when Jess passes out and is in her bed. Ah, uh, yeah, that's what I consider to be the ending. This is the ending that I love so much uh, because it's a it's a really long shot too, uh, where the police are in there and they're talking, and then Mister Harrison passes out, and so everyone leaves, and the house is completely empty again. And then after all of this time where you think, okay, I'm finally safe and the camera just lingers there and just stays there and doesn't move and nothing's happening. I got this feeling of, oh crap, the killer is still in the house. And the camera begins to just slowly move back and then down the hallway and you get to see the two rooms of where the murders happened. And then you hear Billy up in the attic moving around and talking. And then the last thing you see before it cuts back to the exterior of the house is the attic door opening. And then, because the exterior of the house, credits start rolling, and then the phone starts ringing. You know, ex and for me, ex uh, I knew exactly what happened, and that was enough for me to just kind of freeze. And I love it so much. Oh yeah, the ending is absolutely brilliant because it kind of comes full circle because the opening of the film is that exterior shot of the house, right? And we do start with that very unsettling sequence of Billy climbing up into the attic. And then, of course, we think there's resolution. And my girlfriend was um, from the whole time. She's like, it's Peter. I told you it was Peter the whole time. And then once that phone call started ringing, she's like, wait, what? <laughs> it's it's not Peter. You're telling me it's not Peter. And you're telling me he's still up there. And I'm like, yep, um, he is. So and I will say my expectations were played with a little bit, whether it was Peter because Peter says something about keeping the baby and then she gets a phone call and he kind of Billy verbatim repeats um, their conversation. And that's why right. Jess says, um, oh, God. And he's like, why did you say that? And she's uh, covers that whole thing up. But, yeah, absolutely. When it does come full shot with that ending sequence and you realize that there is no safety to this. And there is no resolution like you were hoping for in the end. I think there's uh, a deeper meaning to that. But just on the pure atmospheric horror level, it does its job by unsettling us mm -hmm. um, completely and giving us that lingering feeling afterwards. Yeah, this is the kind of movie that scares me. There are very few movies that leave me with this sense of just fear when I walk out of it or when I finish it, this is one of those movies where because there is no resolution anywhere in this movie and just that phone call and seeing the officer right outside the door, but knowing nothing of it does a really good job of making a movie effective in my mind. Oh yeah. And once again, the threat is always internal. Yeah. The threat is never external. They're safer wandering the streets than they are within their own house, which is, that's just a very unsettling feeling oh, yeah. thinking about as well. And if I'm not mistaken, through that ending shot with the phone call, there's no score being played. Nope. It's simply the phone call getting louder and louder. And I do love that once again, they're not using music to influence our emotions because I almost think if they would have started bringing in the score, that may have taken me out of the film because I was already so engrossed. I didn't need any type of music. Um, and I, once again, I think that just lends itself to the realism of the story. Uh, just the phone call getting louder is definitely enough to unsettle you, which I was glad they, they didn't. Uh, go any further with that oh yeah and you also have no idea what billy did to her either yeah that i think is the scariest part about all this is yeah you know that she's probably dead but what exactly billy did we have no clue and i think the reason there isn't a resolution and we literally hear this um phone call ringing is because i think probably on more of a meta level that's almost kind of a wake-up call mm -hmm. that could wake jess up to get her out of the house or that could be too late for her. 
and she could die as well. And we could see that the authorities are outside. The authorities have already made their decision, just like the authorities already made their decision with the abortion case. But now it's really left up to the individual to decide um, more so just about the this these broader issues in general. Right. Are you going to go along with these issues or are you going to leave and change your mind? So in a much broader medicines, I think that's probably what they're trying to say with the film is we're going to leave it up to you. We're not going to tell you how it's going to end um, because it's really uh, up to the individual. How are they going to live their life, essentially? Right. Well, and this film is not only just touching on the topic of abortion, but introducing a young female character that's pregnant is clearly hearkening back to the whole reason we celebrate Christmas. And that's because of Christ and right. the birth of Christ through the Virgin Mary. And um, I think that's also a very big topic as well is this kind of black it's literally called Black Christmas. Right. So it's going to be kind of an inverted dark form of that life. So instead of bringing life and joy, it seems to be bringing death and destruction, but not for the point of just simply being evil, but I would say for the point of um, kind of calling our attention to the fact. And I will say in that respect, it is able to go a bit deeper than Halloween because Halloween is just this really old Celtic tradition that is slightly touched upon within the second film. But this has a much more religious meaning behind it. And it's mm -hmm. a completely religious uh, tradition connected with that. The word Christmas has the word Christ within it. So when we see this very... Um, anti-type of Christ infiltrating this house and even infiltrating within the hearts and minds of these characters where this woman wants to have an abortion around the time that we celebrate the birth of Christ really does even, even really does bring a much darker uh, tone and thought to the rest of the film. And I would also show that it also is bringing up the question of how far we have become removed from the initial uh, very first Christmas 2,000 years ago is now um, all of these poor young women are dying and children are found murdered in the park and a woman wants to have an abortion all around this time where it's supposed to be all about redemption and salvation. Right. Alan, what is your rating and recommendation for Black Christmas? Like I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast during the background info, this was a movie I've just wanted to see for a long time and never really got a chance to until it was finally released on Prime. Uh, that's because I had heard about this movie. I heard about the uh, the impact and the legacy that has left since it was released back in the 1970s. I wish I would have been able to see it earlier, but I'm glad I, I'm glad I got to see it now. And now that I own it on Blu-ray, I'll be able to watch it traditionally. So... Yeah, I ended up loving this movie a lot, honestly, a lot more than I had thought that I would because uh, I was thinking it would be more of a movie that kind of lost what exactly it was doing over time because of how many things have taken and derived from it. And while in some instances, in some instances, that still may be true. I think it's also interesting to see where it all stems from, or at least a lot of horror movie cliches, horror movie cliches where those start, tend to stem, stem from. So yeah, I absolutely adored this movie. I love that there is no resolution basically at all. And the ending of this movie still gives me the chills just thinking about it and thinking about that connection between the killer and our main character. It just is a really good way of making a movie extremely effective. So yeah. If you want to go see Bob Clark's other movies, I mean, I suppose you can, but this one is by far his best up until this point, um, that in, at least in terms of his releases, this is by far the best one of the four. Uh, so yeah, I would absolutely recommend this movie. Uh, definitely going to be one that I'll watch probably uh, time and time again and hopefully become some kind of tradition for me. Uh, so yeah, in the end, I'm going to give it 8 out of 10. High recommend. Black Christmas is my favorite horror film. 
not only because it features the most succinct story, but it, because it also leaves the terror up to the viewer's imagination. No backstory is given for the murderer, and the murders themselves are briefly glimpsed. Clark uses the first act to create atmosphere, and settles us in for the remaining time to raise our blood pressure as the night grows increasingly serious. Unlike most horror films, the storytellers give us a vested interest in Jess with her pregnancy, and toy with her expectations whether her boyfriend Peter is truly the psychopath upstairs. Containing the most frightening and suspenseful end for a horror film I've ever seen, Black Christmas kept me wound up and then let me go, even during the credits as the phone rang louder and louder. And of course, not to mention the broader subtext that the film so cleverly weaves within the story. It's not just a film about a crazy murderer killing the sorority women in Toronto, Canada, but it also brings up the deeper question about our comfortability with death within our culture. That being said, and I can firmly say after giving this a lot of thought and, and after two viewings over the course of a few months, I am going to give Black Christmas 10 stars out of 10 with my highest recommendation. And I will say it, I do like this film slightly better than Halloween because I think it hits those highs and achieve things that just a bit better than Halloween. Yeah, does. I remember you and I were talking about uh, possibly doing Black Christmas sometime. I don't know, it was before we even decided the, the uh, Halloween special. And I brought up Black Christmas and how I wanted to see it. And I remember you said specifically uh, that you think that it is scarier than Halloween. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's high praise coming from a guy who is one of the biggest Halloween fans that I know. Don't get me wrong, listeners. I adore John Carpenter's Halloween. I think the film is absolutely brilliant. I just think that what we see here and experience here in Black Christmas is just a deeper experience of that frightening terror than what we get in Halloween. Halloween is very different in many respects, but I think this this one just really drives home the story and just packs a wallop with, with what we're given here. So I guess I got to ask the question of you, Alan. Is this a better film than Halloween or, or do you still think Halloween is better? Or are they too different for you to decide? I don't think that they're too different for me to decide. Um, I think I remember, if I remember right, I gave Halloween a nine when we reviewed it. And I still do stick by that nine. I think the reason why I give it a slightly higher score than Black Christmas uh, is because I think that the technical side of what it does, uh, what it does cinematically is much more fulfilling on my end. Uh, for me to look at, mostly like cinematography wise, music wise, etc. However, I do enjoy this movie a little bit more because this one does get under my skin and leaves and stays under my skin for much longer than what Halloween does. So it's kind of both. I like them both some ways better than others for each one of them over the other one, but for different reasons. I will be curious to see if that ever changes over time because you've had much more time with Halloween right? and you've probably seen it more often than Black Christmas. So I'm wondering if Black Christmas will ever overtake that for you. And Black Christmas, it's it's not much higher than Halloween. Oh, no, no. Yeah. I will say. the It's not much higher. The eight I gave it uh, here is very extremely close to a nine. Um but yeah, and it's like you said, also when I literally just watched it for the first time this week, so it hasn't had a lot of time to settle in my stomach and see how much I really feel about it. Unlike Halloween, where I've seen it a number of times over a longer period of time than this one. So we'll see. The, my, the jury's still out. I don't know uh, how much this will impact the future going into the future. I will say this is the film that I was at least the look of the film, I, this is what I was always hoping Halloween actually was. Yeah. And I think all of those years building up to me seeing Halloween, being curious about it, of course, not being allowed to watch it because I don't think you should let your child watch Halloween um, or your tween or whatever. But I was always thinking that um, this is what Halloween was going to look like and feel like. And they both look and feel very 
different, I would say. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I read an article kind of comparing the two, and I think I might have got them mixed up, and that also may have contributed to uh, my expectations for Halloween. But I would just say the look of this film, I like better. Just That's just yeah. me. Um, listeners, you may also be seeing trailers coming out for a Blumhouse production, kind of a looks like a total reimagining of a new Black Christmas film coming to you. I don't know when it's coming out. Sometime coming this out year. Soon. I know it's coming out in 2019, yeah. but this also is not the first time that Christmas has been remade. I believe it was a 2003 uh, remake. 2006. Okay, 2006, yeah. That was yeah. the second or the first remake from Black Christmas since it was released in 1974. Yeah, I have not seen the 2006 one. I think I've seen a clip from it and it looked like garbage. Yeah. Um, the poster looks like garbage. Unlike the poster for this film, which is great. Yeah, I want to own it. Like I have my Blade Runner <laughs> poster. I want to own it and frame it on my wall because I think it looks great. It does look great. But uh, yeah, your your mom might be a little creeped out if she ever comes to when she ever comes to visit. That's true. You. <laughs> I, it's a good thing I don't live with her. Maybe I'll just hide it when she's whenever she comes to visit or something. <laughs> yeah, um, the sequel was very poorly received. Um, not the sequel, excuse me, the remake, the 2006 remake of Black Christmas. People hate it with a passion. I have no desire to ever go watch it. I have better things to do. <laughs> the new Blumhouse one, I don't think looks very good. But once again, it's like, don't remake Halloween. And they did remake Halloween. We didn't like it very well. And then they made a sequel to Halloween, which was fine. But I don't know. What are they What are they doing? I feel like it. It, I don't understand what they're doing with this new movie. Hey, money is my only guess. Money, yeah. They're like, let's revive a title and a fran uh, for a thing that's barely been used before, and we'll just make a cash grab, right. I guess. Right. It'll be interesting to see what it what the finished product is, but I have a good feeling. I've seen something like this happen before many times, and every time I've seen it happen, it has failed. Yeah, and you know what? Maybe it'll be okay. Maybe it'll be passable. I don't know, but I, I'm going to fall down where Alan is saying that as well. I don't think it's going to do very well. Um, it just doesn't really make any sense, and this is such a great film. So, listeners, I highly recommend it. Please go watch this on Prime. Treat yourself this Halloween, and we do hope you are having a great, safe Halloween enjoying some candy with some family and friends, or if you're by yourself and you're having a great movie marathon as well. We just released the men in black international podcast, concluding our men in black movie review series for now. So go ahead and make sure to check that out. And this Monday we will be coming back to Shyamalan after quite the break. So we will be coming back with our review of lady in the water, which I'm looking forward to all of you uh, listening to our discussion of that kind of often overlooked Shyamalan film. Yeah, it'd be interesting uh, to see what I think about it, because this is the one I think I've heard almost the least about, I believe, outside of Last Airbender. Yeah, I know that neither of us have seen Lady in the Water, except the trailer scared me. <laughs> when when the movie was coming out the trailer was quite frightening to my young soul um but is the movie actually scary i don't know i uh, will find out in our review so listeners make sure to join us next monday with our review of lady in the water thanks for joining me on this halloween special alan sure thing okay listeners but we do want to know don't forget to comment below what you think of Black Christmas, especially if this is your first time coming to it or if you've actually been seeing this film for a long time. Do you love it? Do you hate it? Do you think it's not that good? Do you think it's better than Halloween? Do you think I'm crazy and nothing could ever touch the, the heights of Halloween? I don't know. I want to know. Let both of us know in the comment section below. I'm very curious to see what you all think of this film. And also comment your favorite Halloween movie. Thank you so much for joining us, listeners. Once again, have a very happy Halloween, and we will see you next week with Lady in the Water. Hey, listeners, it's Corbin. Don't forget to check out the exciting links in the description below that will connect you with more great movie reviews for your listening pleasure and our YouTube 
Facebook and Twitter page. And of course, our official website where you can read great articles and sign up for our free weekly newsletter. Also, if you want exclusive bonus content such as extra movie reviews, movie commentaries, and our thoughts on the latest movie news and trailers, plus more, then check out our Patreon page. It's a great way to help keep this show free, and it gives you great content that's yours to keep. All of that and more is found in the description below. Don't forget to subscribe whether you're on YouTube, Apple, Google, or Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. And while you're at it, please leave us a five-star review so other movie lovers can more easily find our podcast. We love talking about movies, and we love talking about them with you. So don't forget to share with your friends and family, and we'll see you next week, listeners. The Silver Screen Guide podcast is edited and produced by Alan and Corbin. Intro and outro music is created by Thomas Rankin. The thoughts and opinions herein expressed are those of the individual and do not necessarily represent those held by Silver Screen Guide. Silver Screen Guide is not affiliated with any company or individual involved with the creation of this movie or TV show. No portion of the podcast may be used without express written permission from Silver Screen Guide. Um, we might have to re-record. This might be the fourth annual. I don't know. I need to check. Let's see. We did Psycho, Halloween. Poltergeist. Poltergeist. I think that's it. I don't think we did anything else. So this will be the fourth one? This is the fourth one, yes. Shoot. I introduced this as our third annual. Crap. All oh, right. No. Re-records. Here we come. Oh, boy. <laughs>